Hello, I'm Sean Rehag. I'm the director of York University Center for Refugee Studies and a faculty member at Osgoode Hall Law School. This video is part of the CRS Online Introduction to Refugee Studies. In this video, we'll be looking at Canada's refugee determination system. We'll begin with an overview of the history of that system. Then we'll look at how claims are processed in Canada. Then we'll conclude by looking at some controversial steps that Canada has taken to try to limit access to that system. Let's begin with history. Canada, it must be said, has a troubling history when it comes to immigration. Any account of that history must begin by acknowledging that immigration was, from the outset, a tool of colonization. It was the primary means through which land belonging to Indigenous peoples was wrested away for use predominantly by European settlers. For much of Canadian history, immigration was also explicitly racist in other forms as well. Many steps were taken to attempt to prevent immigration by anyone not considered white, with a particular focus placed on limiting immigration from Asia. Other groups have also been systematically excluded from Canada, including people with disabilities and people with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. Notwithstanding this troubling history, it is worth acknowledging that Canada has taken many measures to present itself as being open to immigration. And indeed, Canada is among the countries with the highest proportion of immigrants relative to the population. When it comes specifically to refugees, many accounts of Canada's history begins in the mid-1880s, when thousands of people enslaved in the United States arrived in Canada as their final stop on the Underground Railroad. In the next generation, as the Canadian government was seeking out farmers to settle the prairie provinces in the West, two groups of refugees were welcomed, the Mennonites and the Dukabors, both from Russia. The treatment of these groups, however, was not an indicator of a more general openness towards refugees. Following World War I, Canada opposed the admission of refugees on the grounds that once refugees were admitted, they could generally not be deported. This argument was used repeatedly by Canada throughout the early years of the development of the international refugee system, including when Canada refused to accept the Nansen Passport a travel document created by the League of Nations in 1922 to allow refugees to travel. In the interwar period, the rise of Hitler in Germany presented Canada with an important test, a test that ultimately Canada failed. In the 1930s, the Jewish community in Canada, as well as some non-Jewish groups, attempted to persuade the Canadian government to accept Jewish refugees from Germany but Canadian immigration policy at the time was dominated by anti-Semitism, and their requests were denied. In one of the most shameful episodes of Canadian history, the Canadian government was one of several governments that turned away the ship, the SS St. Louis, which was carrying 907 Jewish refugees, many of whom were eventually killed in the Holocaust. During the entire 12-year period of Nazi rule in Germany, Canada admitted only 5,000 Jewish refugees. This was one of the worst records of any democratic country in the world. Following World War II, Canadian immigration policy began to open up, and Canada began to admit a larger number of refugees. This included tens of thousands of Hungarian refugees fleeing Soviet troops in 1956. However, the choice of which refugees to admit was still largely influenced by racial prejudice and political bias, with virtually all admitted refugees coming from Europe. Moreover, despite being closely involved in the drafting of the 1951 Refugee Convention, Canada did not actually accede to the convention until 1969. By the early 1970s, Canada's refugee resettlement programs finally began to expand, this led Canada to accept a group of Tibetan refugees in 1970, Ugandan Asian refugees in 1972 and 73, and Chilean refugees fleeing the Pinochet regime in the mid-1970s. A major turning point for Canada's refugee resettlement programs came in the late 1970s. 
In the mid-1970s, the governments of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia fell to communist forces. This led to nearly 1.5 million refugees fleeing their homes. In June 1979, the Canadian government announced that it would resettle 50,000 Southeast Asian refugees by the end of 1980. Broad support from the Canadian public gave rise to the new Private Sponsorship of Refugees program. Through this program, Canadian groups and families sponsored refugees to come to the country. In the end, public pressure caused the Canadian government to increase the number of refugees resettled. 60,000 were admitted by the end of 1980. Throughout the 1980s, tens of thousands more Vietnamese, Cambodians, and Laotians were resettled. This earned the people of Canada the Nansen Medal, awarded by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in 1986 in recognition of the major and sustained contribution to the cause of refugees. Another turning point in Canadian refugee protection history occurred on April 4, 1985. On that day, the Supreme Court of Canada issued its decision in Singh. In that case, the Supreme Court decided that refugee claimants are entitled to protections under Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. To this day, April 4th is celebrated as Refugee Rights Day in Canada. In finding that refugee claimants are entitled to constitutional protections under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the court ruled that refugee claimants are entitled to procedural fairness in the refugee determination process. The court also found that procedural fairness required, in most cases, that refugee claimants have an oral hearing. This led directly to the creation of the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada in 1989. The main purpose of that board, at least initially, was to provide refugee claimants with oral hearings. Okay, so that covers some of the key moments in the history of how Canada has responded to refugee issues. What about how things work today? Well, today, there are two different ways that people can acquire refugee protection in Canada. The first category is inland protection, which will be explored in this video. Inland protection occurs when asylum seekers make their own way to Canada and make a refugee claim from within the country or at the border. These refugee claimants are then subject to the Canadian Refugee Determination System, through which their claims are determined by the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. The second category is that of overseas protection, which we will explore in another video. Overseas protection involves the resettlement of refugees from abroad by the Canadian government or through private sponsorship. All right, let's look at how the inland refugee determination process works. The process begins when a refugee claimant indicates a desire to claim protection. This can be done at an inland office within Canada, or it can be done at a port of entry, which includes airports, seaports, and land crossings. Regardless of where the claim is made, the claimant is required to fill out forms that set out the basis of the claim. Once a claim is made, an officer will determine whether the claimant is eligible to have their claim heard. The officer will either be a Canada Border Services Agency staff member if the claim is made at a port of entry, or they'll be an Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada staff member if the claim is made within Canada. Claimants will be found to be ineligible if they have made refugee claims in countries with which Canada has an information sharing agreement, which currently includes the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, and New Zealand. They will also be found ineligible if they have already received refugee protection in another country, or if they have made a prior claim in Canada. Claimants are also ineligible if they are covered by the Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement, or if they are inadmissible on security or certain criminality grounds. If a claim is found to be eligible, and the vast majority are, then the claim will be referred to the Immigration and Refugee Board for a hearing. While claimants are awaiting their hearings, they have certain rights and may have access to certain services within Canada. In particular, adult claimants may acquire a work permit or a study permit. Minors have access to school without any permit. Claimants also have access to the Interim Federal Health Program, 
which provides limited temporary health care coverage for refugee claimants. Ideally, refugee claimants should be assisted by a lawyer in completing their application and in their hearing at the Immigration and Refugee Board. Depending on their situation, claimants may qualify for legal aid provided by the province where they are located. Unfortunately, legal aid is not available to all claimants and may not cover all of the services required. As noted earlier, it was the landmark decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in Singh that led to the creation of the Immigration and Refugee Board. That case involved several refugee claimants who had had their refugee claims denied without having had an oral hearing. The Supreme Court of Canada found that as a matter of Canadian constitutional law, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms applied to refugee claimants who are physically present in Canada. The court also found that among the rights enjoyed by refugee claimants are the rights to a procedurally fair refugee determination process. The court went on to find that for the refugee determination process to be fair, it must at a minimum provide an oral hearing where the claimant's credibility is at stake. A fair refugee determination process must also provide refugee claimants with the opportunity to know the case that has been made against them and with the opportunity to provide their arguments in response. Four years after the ruling, the federal government created the Immigration and Refugee Board. The IRB is Canada's largest administrative tribunal. It is responsible for making decisions on immigration and refugee matters in accordance with the provisions of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act and its associated regulations. The IRB is an expert, quasi-judicial decision-making body that operates at arm's length from the government. The IRB consists of four divisions. The Refugee Protection Division, the Refugee Appeal Division, the Immigration Division, and the Immigration Appeal Division. The Refugee Protection Division, or the RPD, is responsible for determining refugee claims. A panel consisting of a single RPD member will make a determination whether a claimant meets the refugee definition or is otherwise a person in need of protection. For Convention refugees, the question is whether the claimant has a well-founded fear of persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. For more discussion about that definition, please see the video about international refugee law. For persons in need of protection, the question is whether the claimant would be subject to a risk of torture, a risk to their life, or a risk of cruel and unusual treatment or punishment. At a refugee hearing, the claimant can be represented by counsel and will be questioned by the RPD member about the basis of their claim for protection and about the documentation that the claimant has collected and submitted in support of that application. That documentation can include documents from the country of origin, photos, affidavits, information about country conditions, and other documents. If a claimant requires an interpreter, one will be provided. The rules of evidence at the RPD are much more relaxed than those in a traditional court. That's because it's recognized that claimants who are outside their countries of origin and may have fled in a hurry may face difficulties in documenting their claims. In addition to the elements of the claim, at issue in the hearing is the identity and credibility of the claimant. The claimant's counsel may have the opportunity to ask questions and to present submissions to the RPD member. In some cases, for example, where there are particular concerns about security or criminality, the Minister of Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada may also be represented at the hearing and may question the claimant. Following the hearing, the board member will issue a decision. If the decision is negative, written reasons for the decision must be provided. The Refugee Appeal Division, or RAD, was established in 2012. Its role is to hear appeals from RPD decisions. Not all refugee claimants whose cases are denied by the RPD are entitled to appeal the decision to the RAD. The government restricted access to the RAD for certain groups. These include designated foreign nationals, that is, refugee claimants who arrive in Canada as part of a group designated by the Minister of Public Safety as a, quote, irregular arrival, unquote. 
Second, claimants whose claims were found to have no credible basis or to be manifestly unfounded or fraudulent. And third, those whose claims were heard as a result of exceptions to the Safe Third Country Agreement. For example, if they have family members here in Canada and thus were allowed to cross the U.S.-Canada border. For claimants who have access to the RAD, the process is usually based solely on a paper review, though it is possible in some limited circumstances for the RAD to hold a hearing. Either way, there are three possible outcomes. First, the RAD can confirm the RPD decision. Second, the RAD can quash the decision and send it back down for redetermination by the RPD. And third, the RAD can substitute its own decision. The implementation of the RAD, even with the current restrictions, was a very important move. Prior to 2012, unsuccessful refugee claimants were unable to appeal their decisions and could only seek a remedy through a process of judicial review at the federal court. Judicial review was only available if the claimant received leave or permission from the court, and 9 out of 10 applications for leave for judicial review were refused by the court. In any event, it was very difficult to succeed with a judicial review if the RPD had simply misjudged the facts of the case. That's because judicial review normally focuses on errors of law rather than on mistaken factual findings. Today, applications for leave for judicial review are still available, either directly from the RPD for those who don't have access to the RAD, or through judicial reviews of a RAD decisions for those who do. If the federal court does not grant the judicial review, then the decision is final, subject to very limited opportunities to appeal to the federal court of appeal. If the federal court does grant the judicial review, then the case goes back to the Immigration and Refugee Board for redetermination. When applications for protection are granted, whether initially or as a result of the appeal or review processes, the refugee claimant becomes a protected person. At that point, they are likely to receive permanent residence in Canada and ultimately to become citizens of Canada. If the claim is rejected and the claimant exhausts all opportunities for appeal or review, there are two further avenues that the claimant may choose to avail themselves of in order to remain in Canada. The first is a pre-removal risk assessment, and the second is a humanitarian and compassionate application for permanent residence. A pre-removal risk assessment, or PRA, is not a mechanism for correcting errors in the initial refugee determination. Rather, it is used to determine whether things have changed since the claimant's hearing such that they are now at risk in their country of origin. As such, applicants can only raise new relevant evidence that was not reasonably available at the time of the hearing. Moreover, there are restrictions on when PRAWs are available that prevent people who have recently had their cases denied from accessing this procedure. Taken together, this means that PRAWs are seldom successful for refugee claimants whose initial claims were denied. An application for permanent residence in Canada on humanitarian and compassionate grounds is a discretionary measure and it requires immigration officers to consider public policy considerations and humanitarian and compassionate considerations that might justify giving an exception to a person who would not normally be eligible to become a permanent resident in Canada. Humanitarian and compassionate applications are often made when an individual is facing removal. Examples of relevant considerations include the length of time that the individual has been in Canada, how settled the person is, general family ties to Canada, the best interests of any children who might be involved, and what might happen to the individual if the request is not granted. This recourse, however, is not available to people who have received a negative decision from the Immigration and Refugee Board within the prior 12 months, or if they have a pending refugee claim. For most refugee claimants, if their claim fails, they will be legally required to leave the country. When refugee claimants first make their claim, they are given a conditional removal order. If they receive a positive decision at any point, the order will not be enforced, and once they become a permanent resident, it is considered void. However, the removal order becomes enforceable by the Canada Border Services Agency if the claim is rejected and the claimant exhausts all recourses, 
That applies even if they have made a humanitarian and compassionate application, because such applications do not stop removal. At that point, a Canada-wide arrest may be issued for a refugee claimant who fails to appear for a scheduled removal. Asylum seekers with enforceable removal orders are no longer eligible for social assistance or for most other government services. If they are viewed as posing a flight risk or a risk to the public, they may be detained and Canada Border Services Agency may escort them to their country of origin. The Canadian refugee determination process is sometimes pointed to as a good system to emulate internationally. The reason for this is that the system provides more procedural protections to refugee claimants than many other systems. For example, as we have seen, Canada's refugee determination system includes the right to an oral hearing before an independent decision maker, the right to know the opposing case and to respond, the right to written reasons for negative decisions, and in many cases, the right to appeal. Moreover, the Immigration and Refugee Board is generally regarded as a well-functioning independent administrative tribunal and as being made up of competent and professional decision makers. The Immigration and Refugee Board's independence is particularly important given the frequent politicization of migration. This independence allows the Immigration and Refugee Board to avoid becoming entangled in political disputes or being subject to the interference of the Canadian government of the day. Of course, the system has been the subject of some critique. For example, concerns have been raised about efficiency and costs. Moreover, Governments of the day can undermine the Immigration and Refugee Board by failing to provide it with adequate resources. There are also periodic concerns raised about the quality of some decision makers, as well as about political interference in the nomination process. Moreover, some scholarship, including work that I have undertaken, raises concerns about fairness and consistency in the process. Nonetheless, I think it would be fair to say that Canada's refugee determination process is generally well regarded. It does, however, suffer from one very important limitation. Recall that the Supreme Court's landmark decision in Singh was that refugee claimants, by virtue of their physical presence in Canada, are entitled to constitutional protections, including the right to procedural fairness in the refugee determination process. While this was a major victory for refugee rights, it also created a strong incentive for the Canadian government to prevent refugee claimants from getting to the country in the first place and thereby accessing those rights. These efforts have been facilitated partly by geography. Canada is relatively isolated and there are no easy direct land connections with major source countries for refugees. Moreover, Canada is a world leader in using tools to interdict refugees. This includes deploying immigration officers overseas, maintaining strict visa regimes, and imposing fines or carrier sanctions on airlines and other transportation companies that bring refugees to the country. One particularly important tool that Canada uses to block the arrival of refugee claimants is the 2004 Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement. Under the terms of this agreement, Canada can send back to the United States asylum seekers who present themselves at an official port of entry along the Canada-US border. The theory behind this agreement is that both Canada and the United States are safe for refugees, and thus asylum seekers should claim protection in the first of these two countries that they reach. As a consequence, unless they fall within an exception to the agreement, Refugee claimants presenting themselves at an official port of entry at the Canada-US border will be sent back to the US. There, they may be placed in immigration detention and may ultimately be deported. Given the differences between the Canadian and US refugee determination systems, especially during the administration of US President Trump, this agreement has been the subject of much criticism. Many have argued that the U.S. is not a safe country for many asylum seekers and that Canada should suspend the agreement. In 2017, several Canadian non-governmental organizations joined an individual litigant and her children in a constitutional challenge to the Safe Third Country Agreement in the federal court. The litigants argued, in part, that sending refugee claimants back to the United States violates the constitutional rights that they are entitled to under the Singh decision. In the summer of 2020, Canada's federal court held that the U.S. is not safe for at least some refugees 
and that Canada cannot send asylum seekers back to the U.S. without violating their constitutional rights. As of the time that we are recording this video, the agreement nonetheless remains in effect, however, because the government has several months to appeal the decision. It is worth noting that regardless of its constitutionality, the Canada-U.S. Safe Third Country Agreement has had a significant impact in terms of increasing the number of irregular border crossings. This is because the Safe Third Country Agreement only applies at official ports of entry. If refugee claimants are able to cross into Canada at another point along the border, once they are within Canada, they can present themselves to Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada and make an inland claim for protection. Because this allows access to Canada's refugee determination process, it provides an incentive for asylum seekers to cross the border irregularly. And tens of thousands of asylum seekers have done just that in the past several years. Issues such as those surrounding the Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement have proven controversial in Canadian politics. Some groups have called on the Canadian government to suspend the Safe Third Country Agreement in order to protect refugee rights. Others have called on the Canadian government to expand the Safe Third Country Agreement across the entire border in order to discourage irregular border crossings. This division is symptomatic of broader debates about refugee policy in Canadian society, and it reflects the politicization of migration. As different governments are elected, Canada sees expansions and restrictions on refugee protection. Some governments enhance the inland refugee determination process, others seek to limit it. Some push to provide greater procedural protections to refugee claimants, others do the opposite. From this, we can see the political nature of responses to those seeking refugee protection in Canada. This has been a pattern throughout the history of refugee protection in Canada. As we have seen, this includes decisions to embrace some groups of refugees while excluding others, often on problematic grounds such as race, religion, or politics. This, I think, points to the wisdom of one of the cornerstones of Canadian refugee law. As we have seen, the Singh decision established that, in theory, refugee claimants are entitled to constitutional protections in Canada, including the right to a fair refugee determination process. However, it was the creation of the Immigration and Refugee Board as an independent, arm's length administrative tribunal that made the right to access a procedurally fair refugee determination process real in practice. It is my hope that politicians do not lose sight of the troubling lessons from Canada's refugee history and that they resist the urge to take more political control over Canada's inland refugee determination system.